All right, so we we're working through the hierarchy of matter, and we talked about uh, subatomic particles. Well, first we introduced elements, then we started talking about subatomic particles. Uh, and now I want to take those subatomic particles, put them together in the context of an atom. So hopefully you recognize that that would be something we might find on the periodic table of elements. That's going to be helium. And then there's some numbers around the elemental symbol, which is HE in this particular element. It's, uh, uh, an atom is going to be made up of, or consist of, or be a compound of subatomic particles. Now, without looking back in your notes, ignore your notes, how much is a neutron or a proton? One Dalton. So let's keep that in mind because we're going to use that in just a second. So when we start to put the subatomic particles, particles together in different numbers, we begin to build these atoms, and those atoms are what retain an element's property. And usually when we talk about properties, one of the big things we're talking about is the ability to form chemical bonds, which we'll get to a little bit later. Now, in terms of the atom, I want you to be familiar with three quantities. Slash characteristics. Or characters. So three quantities or characters. The first of these quantities, so when I say quantity, I'm basically telling you I want you to know a little bit of something about a value. So some sort of value descriptor for an atom. The first quantity is the atomic number. And the atomic number is going to equal or consist of the number of protons. And the number of protons that we have in the atomic nucleus is going to determine the unique element. So the atomic number will be unique to an element. So if we have an atomic number 8, that's going to be unique to oxygen. And that indicates that oxygen will always have eight protons. If it doesn't have eight protons, it's not oxygen. But if it does have eight protons, it's oxygen. So up here, helium, how many protons? Two. Now most elements, what we will find is that each element or most elements, well, elements typically are going to have the number of protons equal to the number of electrons, unless this is indicated in some way. So this would be sodium, equal number of electrons and protons. This would be the sodium ion, where we have one less electron and protons. All right, so that's the atomic number. The next quantity is the mass number. The mass number you are going to calculate by taking the number of neutrons 
and the number of protons and adding them together. So already you should recognize that that's going to be a formula for the weight of the atom as well as its mass number. Because we're taking our neutrons, which weigh how much? One. And our protons that weigh one Dalton, and we're adding those together. So for example, uh, continuing in the thread of oxygen, oxygen, the eight is its atomic number. That means there are eight protons. Protons are balanced against the neutrons, so we'd also have eight neutrons. So what would be our mass number? 16. So this indicates eight protons. This indicates that there are eight more neutrons for a total mass number of 16. The last number is going to be our atomic weight. Our atomic weight is going to be our approximate total mass. So our approximate total mass. As you already know, neutrons and protons, one volt and a piece. Therefore, looking at oxygen, oxygen's atomic weight, 16 dolphins. Now you can actually get some more um, accurate weights. You can see helium here. It would have two protons and two neutrons, so we would say, oh, it's four dolphins. But in reality, that's only an approximate weight. Its true atomic mass would be 4.003. So just a little bit more accurate mass. All right, so to put some of these numbers to work, you can see that we have our mass number and we have our atomic number. And then we could calculate an atomic weight, either approximate or we could actually take that out and try to make it as accurate as possible. Um, so these numbers here, remember, our, uh, our atomic number, which represents the number of protons, is unique to the element. Six is carbon. However, we can make some changes. And you'll notice here that we go from 12 to 14. That's going to be the change in the number of neutrons. We're still going to have six protons, so we're still going to be carbon, but we're going to alter the number of neutrons, which is going to make this carbon slightly different. Still is a type of carbon, but it's an isotope of carbon. So let's define isotope and how those characteristics apply. So an isotope, the elements are going to be the same number of protons. Elements will have the same number of protons. They will differ in the number of neutrons, so a different number of neutrons. Oxygen always has eight protons. Carbon always has six protons. But their number of neutrons in the atomic nucleus could be just a little bit different. Now, what does that mean in terms of the atomic weight? in the mass number. Between these two isotopes, atomic weight and atomic, uh, or atomic, the atomic weight and the mass number are going to be different. So the carbon-12 isotope has a different atomic weight and a different mass number than the carbon-14. Isotope. 
Now you might think isotopes, why are they important, especially in biology? Usually I hear of this kind of stuff and carbon dating or radioactivity. Well, it's actually important because all of our elements, whether it's carbon or oxygen or whatever, they actually exist in a population of isotopes and not just specifically as carbon-14 or carbon-12. Okay, so we have all of our elements in an isotope population. And within that isotope population, we're going to have two different types of isotopes. We're going to have a stable isotope. And this will be an isotope that doesn't lose a particle. Carbon-12 is going to be a stable isotope. It's not going to lose another neutron. It's going to have six protons and six neutrons, and it's not going to really change. Unless we add energy and two change. In that population, we're also going to have radioactive isotopes. Radioactive isotopes are going to lose particles. And when they lose particles, they also will lose energy. So energy is released when that particle is lost. Have I used that abbreviation before? And RG? That's my abbreviation. Always a loss of energy. Yep, we're going to lose energy when we lose the particle. If we change the proton. So this changes the proton number. We no longer would have six protons. So we lose that proton. It may change the element. Right? Because if we lose a proton, we no longer have all the protons. Protons define the element. So carbon-14, which is radioactive, it's not going to convert into carbon-12. It's actually going to convert, convert into nitrogen-14, which is the stable isotope of nitrogen. Now, not only do we exist within these isotope populations, within the biological world, but isotopes also from a biotechnology standpoint became really, really important. Uh, about 40 years ago. We can use this idea. We can make molecules, but let's say that I wanted to look at the production of carbon dioxide. I could make carbon dioxide or I could make glucose using a radioactive form of carbon. I could synthesize that in the lab and then I could give it to a lab animal. And I could look at the carbon dioxide that's being produced and I could measure the presence for the presence of that carbon radioactive carbon molecule. And so the use of these radioactive isotopes are very important in bio, as biological traces. Have any of you ever heard the term heavy water? So heavy water is going to be water that contains, uh, it's going to basically be hydrogen that's radioactive. And they build water molecules with it. If I were to drink that, which actually it's not that bad for me to drink, but it's not radioactive in the sense that I'm going to throw an extra to it. It just is going to lose a proton. So I can drink that water, and I can know how much I put in, and then I can measure how much 
I'll put it in here and I can measure how well my kidneys are filtering my blood. Tracers. Yeah, sorry. It's tracers. Again, more you. So we exist in these in this within this context of isotope populations, and then also we can utilize isotopes and get radioactive characteristics as biological tracers, which is important for our understanding in increasing gain of knowledge in biology. All right, the electron on its own is really, really important in the context of energy and in the context of creating chemical bonds and rearranging chemical bonds. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time here talking about the characteristics of electron and how it relates to energy. Because in the end, all of us in a biological world are just simply energy transforms. We take energy and convert it into another form of energy so that we can perform work like this. So the electron, not the proton and the neutron, but only the electron is involved in reactions. And really it's chemical reactions that the electrons are going to be involved in. So right now, as you're sitting here, you're not really doing anything except for maybe typing on your computer or writing notes. It doesn't seem like it's a very energetic and demanding process. But in all reality, you have thousands and thousands and thousands of chemical reactions ongoing in your body that are changing the form of chemical or form of energy so that you can continue to live. So only the electron is going to be involved in reactions, and energy is going to be a defining characteristic of the electron. In other words, where the electron is going to be located around the atomic nucleus is going to be determined by energy. You can see that we can define the orbits or the shells around the atomic nucleus where the electrons hang out as energy shells. And as that electron moves further and further away from the atomic nucleus, it gets more and more energy. So it absorbs and becomes more energetic. So an electron out here has a higher amount of energy than an electron down here. We're going to get into potential kinetic energy. Think of this as being at the very top of the hill. right? So if you're up here by the cross, you actually hold the most energy that you will on this campus. Because that's the highest point. And as you come down the hill, you lose energy. Same thing with the electron. As it's further away from the atomic nucleus, it contains more energy. And as you move back in towards the atomic nucleus, it will lose energy. So what if I take a chemical reaction that incorporates two different atoms, one that has an electron out here, and one that's going to take that electron from out here and move it in. There's now a difference in the starting energy and the ending energy, right? And that difference in energy is going to be released as that electron goes from one position around the atomic nucleus to the position uh, to another position around another atomic nucleus. Releasing that energy becomes free or available. Some of it's lost as heat, but some of it is available to do the work that you need to do in the practice. That's really what we're going to talk about here for the next probably lecture and a half is all of this with moving electrons around. Because really, when it comes down to it, electrons store energy. Rearranging electrons releases and manages that energy to allow you to utilize that energy to perform the work that you need to do. Okay? I know it sounds really simple, and it's going to be complex, but really, it can be kind of 300,000 foot view. It's really simple. If you reposition an electron, it changes its energy. Some of that energy is released and allows you to 
utilize that energy for work. Why do we always build uh, water towers up on the highest point in town? I don't know where the water tower is in Cleveland, but up in Helen, it's way up on top of the hill. We put it up there because the water is going to hold the highest amount of energy, and it's going to flow downwards as it releases energy, which is what we want it to do, because we want it to come to our faucet without having to put in a whole bunch of energy and make it happen. So, electrons are defined by the energy that they contain. The energy that they contain, energy is going to be the ability to do work. Another way to put that, the ability to do work, is the ability to cause change. So if I want to take a glucose molecule and convert it into ATP, I'm going to rearrange it. Rearrange the electrons in that glucose molecule, eventually generating that ATP molecule. Which then is going to be the currency that I can use in my cells to perform additional work. Catabolism, catabolism, anabolism. Okay, so potential energy. <coughs> Potential energy. What is potential? Okay. Potential energy just simply means energy that is stored and is potentially going to be used to do something. So let's say that right now we take a ball and we put an egg down on the a tennis ball up here, an egg down on the side one, and I drop that tennis ball. What's probably going to happen if I nail the egg? What's going to happen if I hit the egg? It's going to crush it. Why is it going to crush it? So that potential energy, which is what I have here, it has the potential to do work as I'm holding it out the window and I release it, that potential energy then becomes the energy of movement. It's doing that point. And as it rushes down towards the ground, it's increasing in velocity, it's increasing in the amount of force that it produces. Hits that egg, blows that egg on. Now what if I take that tennis ball and I stand and I'm like, three inches over that egg and I drop it. There's still potential energy there, but that potential energy is far smaller now, just by distance altogether. So potential energy, this is going to be what is stored in matter. Whether it's an electron or a tennis ball that I'm holding out the window, everything, if it is matter, it has it has some sort of energy characteristic, some sort of potential energy. As you leave this room today and you go down those stairs, your potential energy is slowly going to drop. The most important thing to know about potential energy is that it changes due to position. I don't know, can you see that? Changes due to position. I get myself into trouble whenever I lecture on this because I usually step up on the table and I say, and then it really takes a picture and send it out on Instagram and the crazy Dr. Reynolds knows and he calls me to the office. So I'm not so how much is my energy? Don't no, take a picture. <laughs> yeah. I have higher potential energy right now than I did just a second ago. So if I step off of the table, what's going to happen? Potential energy decreases. My potential energy decreases. But do I just float there? It's just pretty sweet. Let's try it now. I'm not going to stay there, right? Yeah. And it's because that potential energy, as it leaves, is becoming the energy of motion, kinetic energy. So if I 
jump off, I come down to the ground. I was higher potential energy there, lower potential energy here. The difference between the position here and here, because there is a difference, higher potential energy here, lower potential energy here, that difference is the kinetic energy. Now let's put it into terms of electrons. This is the four. This is on top of the table. There is a distance, positional difference there. Less energy here because it's on the floor, more energy here because it's up on the table. So if I take an electron, and in a chemical reaction, I take it from one of these outer energy shells, and I reorient it into a lower energy shell, and it can be in a different molecule. In fact, most of the time it is in a different molecule. I take it from one molecule into another molecule, from a higher position of potential energy to a lower position of potential energy. When I make that change, some of the energy is lost from the electron. But because of the rules and the laws of thermodynamics, I can't just lose energy. It's only lost from that electron. It's going to be utilized someplace else. So it's not completely gone. It's just lost from the electron. And it's used someplace else in the system. When I jumped off the table from here to here, where did the energy go? Surprisingly enough, I just treated a little bit of heat. As my body moved through the air, there was friction against the air, and that caused a small amount of heat. Where else did the energy go? I'll give you an again, you made a sound. It, yeah, I added energy here into the concrete that I landed on it, and it dispersed it through the concrete, changed the temperature of the concrete. I mean, not a lot. It's not like I just threw the concrete in the whole lot. But, we had a change in the characteristics of the concrete when I added that energy to it. Did anyone take a picture? Is it already on Instagram? Should I get called into another disciplinary meeting again? So remember that potential energy is the stored energy of matter but it is also related to position. Higher up here on the table, lower down here. In terms of electron, higher outer energy shell, lower in the inner energy shells. Another example for your notes. Water. Water has mass, takes up space, so it's qualified as mass. One of the plans here at Truman is to put a lake I don't know if we're really going to do that or not, but there's supposed to be potentially a lake that goes in up here behind the cross. That is going to be water up on a hill. What if I dug a hole and I released all the water out where I opened up the side of the lake? Where's the water going to go? Down the hill. <coughs> That's supposed to be hill, not hill. Let's put it as water. Water on a hill. Maybe it's a hillside reservoir or a hillside lake. You allow it to begin to go down that hillside. It gets pulled down by gravity. And it begins to travel from that high point on the reservoir down towards lower points. Now, That hillside reservoir holding the water, the water has a high amount of potential energy. As it flows from the top of that hill downwards towards, let's say, another body of water down here, higher potential energy here, lower potential energy here, right? What is going on here? Kinetic energy. We're, sh we're shifting from two points of potential energy. What else, a lot of times? When we put here, there's going to be heat. But how about humans? Where do humans put by waterfalls or by the um, outflow of, of the reservoir? We put in things. Yeah, we create electricity. How come we can create electricity? Because we're using that kinetic energy to convert it into another form of, of energy called electricity. Now. Let's just call it an electron position. 
at another electron position, we transition. It's not gravity that's pulling on it now. It's going to be more along the lines of this characteristic called electronegativity rather than gravity. But they're basically synonymous. It's a force that's pulling or moving an object from one location to another location. And as we change position or change location, we're going to change the amount of energy that we're storing. The difference in the energy that's stored is the energy that's available for work. In general terms, matter always moves to areas or locations of lower potential energy. Or to a lower potential energy state. So always we move from a lower potential energy state. So up here on top of the table, I jump out into space and I move down because I'm moving to a lower potential energy state. To prevent this from happening, by the way, we have to use energy and force, right? The table was implying a computing of force on me holding me up. If the table wasn't there, I would have come back down to me. Just like jump. if I jumped up right now, I get up to a higher potential state, but I come right back down. Because there's no energy that's being in the system on the table. So electrons have potential energy. And their potential energy is defined based off of the electron's position relative relative to the nucleus. Electrons are always attracted to the nucleus. And when I say nucleus here, I'm talking about the atomic nucleus of the atom. Why would that be? Why is an electron going to be attracted to the nucleus? Yes, we have a negatively charged electron and a positively charged proton in the nucleus. Opposites always attract. We're going to constantly be pulling that electron in towards a positive charge of the proton in the atomic nucleus. So as we are away from the nucleus, further away from the nucleus, an electron is going to have a higher stored or potential energy. So how can I reduce its potential energy? Move it closer to the nucleus. Now, when we do that, when we move the energy or the electron closer to the nucleus, we do have a decrease in energy. However, it's not quite the same uh, energy loss as we have when I jumped off the table. See, this was called continuous energy loss. We could track my progression through the air in the room until I reached the ground, right? And we could measure potential energy as I was falling from here down to here. And in each instant along the way, I'm going to have a different potential energy, a slightly different potential energy. So there's sort of this potential change, or this constant change of potential energy until I reach my next energy state. And up here, you know, just for Arguing say it was this number say my potential energy was 10, and then when I was down here, it was 9, 8, 
seven, six, five, four, two, two, one, zero. All right? And so I have this constant change, and there are decimals in there as well. We can measure potential energies continuously. These positions here around the atomic nucleus, the electron instantaneously goes from one end of the cell shell to the other end of the shell. Meaning that it's not like falling through the air, it's instantaneously from one energy cell to the other. And so we call it not continuous, but discrete. So energy changes discreetly. This is more like this ball on these stairs where we can only measure potential energy at each step. We can't measure in between. So there's a potential energy up here at the top step, and then the next potential energy we'd be able to measure would be down here on the next step. So we can't measure the potential energy between, basically, as the ball is falling. We'd only be able to measure potential energy here, potential energy here, and potential energy here. So it's discrete. There's one, two, three, rather than this continuous change in potential energy, which is kind of weird, but that's the way that electrons play. They're going to go instantly from one energy shell to another energy shell. And it's not like falling down off of the table or over a water. And really, it's those discrete changes that basically define the energy shell. A higher energy shell is just going to be that discrete location with high energy electrons. A lower energy shell will be the discrete location for lower level energy uh, electrons closer to the atomic nucleus. So when we talk about energy level and when we talk about electron shells or energy shells, really the electron shell in itself is this description of potential energy. It's just simply a description of the potential energy. A higher electron shell means there's a higher potential energy. A lower electron ener energy shell means that there's lower potential energy. So if we're near the nucleus, This would be our first energy shell, or our first electron shell, and it will be represented by the lowest energy electrons. And then in this very discrete pattern, the second energy shell, the third energy shell, which we're not really going to go beyond three energy shells in biology, just because that's not really that relevant for us. We have this increased potential energy with distance. Okay, now, the electrons that are down here in this first energy shell, they can move discreetly up to the second energy shell. They're, they have that capability. It's going to require us to put energy in so that electron can absorb that energy and get popped up to the next potential energy level. So those electrons can change their energy level. In other words, electrons can gain energy if it 
gain means energy. That means the electron has just moved out of shell, moved from an inner shell towards the outer shells. So we have to have energy to make that happen, right? Where can I get energy, do you think, to make that happen? Really, I'm asking you about biological energy production. I could potentially get it from glucose. Ultimately, at the very beginning, I'm going to get it from the sun, and I'm going to use photosynthesis in plants and other photosynthetic organisms to reposition electrons, making new types of molecules, new um, new molecules that then can be utilized by other organisms, and they can break them down, releasing the energy that was put in by photosynthesis. So leafy green plant, maybe the lettuce you have on your salad today, interacts with the sun. The sun causes electrons to move out in their electron shells, gaining energy. The sun has photo energy. That photo energy is converted into chemical energy, which is a reposition of the electron around the atomic nucleus. Now you eat that salad today, and eventually you're going to start to gain energy yourself. Your cells and the molecules that you have in your body are going to begin to utilize the energy contained in those electrons, and you're going to reorganize those electrons from the glucose molecule that you consume from that plant. And you're going to create energy for your own, for your own use. So if we can gain energy and cause electrons to move out, we can also lose and cause electrons to come back in. Now, whenever we lose energy, Whenever we lose energy, we're also going to produce heat. It's just the nature of chemical reactions. So we may undergo a chemical reaction where an electron is moved to a lower energy position. Some of that energy, the, the difference between the initial potential energy and the end potential energy, the energy that's lost, some of it can be used. We would call that free energy. But some of it is going to be lost as heat. So every time we lose energy, we have heat production. Does this make some sense to you all? So when it comes down to metabolism and energy production, your cells are going through the process of using those chemical reactions to just simply change the positional characteristics of electrons. If I take an electron that's bound in glucose and I reorganize that electron into a molecule called glucose 6-phosphate, that's the first step in glycolysis, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. I've reorganized the glucose molecule. And I've actually made a molecule called glucose 6-phosphate that is a higher energy molecule. I'm using electrons from ATP. I have ATP, another molecule, storing electrons. They get pushed into the glucose or the, the chemically reactive glucose. I'm taking one of the phosphates from the ATP molecule and attaching it to the glucose. I reorganize the electrons in that glucose molecule. That molecule of glucose phosphate is now a higher energy and has more potential energy. So that chemical reaction, that first chemical reaction in glycolysis, is all about redistributing the electrons to produce glucose 6-phosphate so those electrons are in higher energy positions around their atomic nucleus, creating higher amounts of potential energy. Okay, I'm going to assume that everybody is, is relatively okay with this. If you're not, it's on the floor about it. 
chances are you're making it more complicated in your mind than it really is. In a chemical reaction, we have our reactant and we have our product. If it's a product that has more potential energy than the reactant, then we have reorganized the electrons in the reactants so that they are positioned further away from their atomic nucleus in the product. In a lot of ways, a lot of times the way we do that is we reorganize a uh, covalent bond. We reorganize some sort of chemical bond to help to pull those electrons out of the way from the atomic nucleus. Another characteristic here of electrons and energy, another descriptive character is the electron orbital. So not only are there these things called electron shells, which is a description of the potential energy of the electron, but we also have these things called electron orbitals. And orbitals are basically the statistical or the, probable, the probability for electrons to be found at a certain location around the atomic nucleus. So you can see there in red the ball-shaped orbital that's called a spherical orbital. And this is basically, you can see that we have it on a coordinate plane, x, y, and z. This is the statistical space where we should expect to find electrons. So electron orbitals are just simply a description of the space where electrons are found most often. And when I say most often, I'm basically saying 90% of the time. So if we could go down to the subatomic level, we would be able to say, okay, here is the space for the S1 orbital. We should find electrons here about 90% of the time. So if we sat around for 100 seconds, 90 of those seconds, we would see electrons. Now, in any given orbital, we are really only allowed to have two or less electrons. <laughs> Oops. Okay, so two or less electrons in any orbital. So if I have eight electrons to distribute through my molecule or my atom rather, how many orbitals would I need? How many? I said if I have eight. I have eight electrons. The, the, yeah, I would need a maximum of, eight, uh, of four orbitals for my eight electrons. And again, this is kind of that statistical description the orbital is of where we're going to find an electron. Which, by the way, if I want to create a chemical bond, I probably want to put two atoms, orbitals, over each other. I want to cause them to um, become in contact or interact, because then I have a higher probability for electrons to be shared between those orbitals, right? So shell one, which is what you can see here, the atomic nucleus would be right here at the intersection of all three axes, and we should expect in this space around that atomic nucleus, 90% of the time we're going to find electrons. By the way, if it was hydrogen, we'd only have one electron. Helium, we would have two electrons. And so that single spherical shell or orbital would be enough for helium, hydrogen, or helium. I'm not going to use any more orbitals. So shell number one, which we abbreviate as the S1 orbital, is going to have a maximum of two electrons, and it is going to have a spherical shape. So we're going to have just this spherical shape where we're going to find two of our electrons. The 1s or S1 orbital. OK, 
okay, now I have another energy shell. I'm just going to simply call it energy shell two or shell two. In that energy shell, I can have up to eight total electrons in the shell. How many orbitals in that shell am I going to need for my eight electrons? Four. So you have a shell, and then that shell is going to be made up of, in this case, up to four different orbitals, each containing at most two electrons in each orbital. So eight total electrons in the shell distributed within, because the energy shell, remember, is a description of the potential energy. The orbital is a description of the location or space that the electrons are going to consume. So shell number two, up to eight total electrons in that energy shell. And to cover all eight of those electrons, I need four different orbitals. So four different orbitals would be required. So we're out of time. Just give me one more minute. Sorry, I'm gonna hold you over this 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 discussion. So in this second energy shell, that second energy shell is still gonna have one. Two s orbital, so we're going to still have a spherical shaped orbital, similar to the s one, but it's in the second energy shell, so we call it two s or the s two. So we have a two s orbital, two because it's the second energy shell, s because it's a spherical shape. It just simply is going to have a bigger radius, right? Because we need to be further away from the atomic nucleus. The spherical shape is going to have a bigger radius than the S1. The S2 is going to be a bigger spherical shape because we're further away positionally from the nucleus to create that higher energy state. Then we're going to have three 2p orbitals. And these 2p orbitals, you can see what they'd be shaped like here. Again, they're basically going to sort of be in that same kind of a fixed space that we find in the 2s, but they have this dumbbell or parabolic shape. So it's going to be 2p. 2 because it's the second energy shell, and p because the shape is more parabolic or dumbbell. Okay? Now, I got a bunch of different orbitals here, and actually it would continue on as we get bigger and bigger molecules. But because this is biology, we basically only need to know about the first 25 elements on the periodic table of elements. Everything after that's not really biologically relevant in terms of biology function. And so you really only need to know through about the third shell here, where you're going to have a 3s and a 3p. We basically can ignore what are called the df and p orbitals. So you just need to know that each energy shell, the first one, energy shell one, we're just going to have a spherically shaped orbital. In the second energy shell, we're going to have that spherically shaped orbital, but we're also going to have the dumbbell shaped orbitals that are oriented in three different directions. Kind of each of the axes is going to have a dumbbell shaped orbital attached. And again, that's just the orbital is just the location of the electron. The energy shell is the potential energy characteristics of the electrons. All right, have a nice weekend.